Coming up on the LCS Preview Show, we break down the playoffs, hand out the Spring Split Awards, and reveal the top plays of 2014. Don't touch that browser. The LCS Preview Show starts right now. Sinai jumps back in. Reckless rejoins the fight. Splits a double for Reckless. SK celebrate that first place position with a dominant win over Millennium. Cloud9 staves off Team Solo Mid one more time to go 3-0 and in the four matches against them. Cloud9 is going to be more than happy to keep sole possession of first place. What's up, everyone? I'm David Freak Turley alongside Josh with Jat Leesman today. We've got a special playoff edition of the LCS Preview Show. Ready for some bonus coverage? I am ready. And Freak, welcome to the preview show. Thank you. It's good yeah. to be here. I love getting up early. I love talking about the games. It's going to be a lot of fun. Today we're going to look at the playoffs, but before we do, we're going to look at how the teams got here. Heading into the final 16 games of the spring, all eight teams were in the playoff hunt with 65,536 possible outcomes, most of which would result in at least one tie. It looked like we were in for an incredibly exciting and extra long final week of the spring over in Cologne. Up first, it was Alliance versus Fnatic in a battle for sole possession of first place, both teams sitting at 14-10. Yeah, and this game really started off intense. Big turret dive coming in right here from Fnatic, trying to get Reckless going early on in the game. Yeah, it was a champion. Vayne, he's very comfortable on. He's going to play that multiple times throughout the week. And you know what's funny, though? Because if you can push Vayne back and make her kite away, you can kind of win fights all on your own if Alliance just kills the rest of Fnatic here. Yeah, rather low kill game, but not low in excitement here because Fnatic came really strongly into this fight and Alliance was fighting so close in this one. So Alliance pulling their way back into this one a little bit, but it all came down to a big end game fight. Peke with a huge pick over onto Nif in this setup Fnatic for a gigantic team fight. Yeah, no more Ghana in this one means Reckless can go a little bit crazy. Doesn't have to fear the Dark Binding, does have to fear the Froggen, but the rest of Fnatic zones properly and gets the stun onto him, which was so, so critical for the damage Fnatic wanted to place. Yeah, the rest of the fight comes through with just great cutting out by Vayne, getting the duel against Shook, the escape from Wicked as well. Fnatic secure first place with that victory off the back of some great performances by all their individual Reckless players. Reckless is uh, pretty good at Vayne. A little bit. I think he's a great player overall. Up next, it was SK's T turn, SK's turn, sorry, in the battle for first place when they took on Fnatic. The original SK. Yeah, there you go. Say. But in this one, it was actually the brush bait by Fnatic. Nobody thought they would stick around that long in the brush. They actually had two wars to make sure they weren't spotted, but they pick up the double kill because of it. And look, Reckless getting fed again. No big surprise in this one. Yeah, However, you think that that would mean they'd win. Yeah, but no, Jess is the rookie mid laner here for SK. Having a great performance on Ziggs, picking up kill after kill. Yeah, the disengage as a team for SK has just been so critical. It's crazy how well SK has done this year without the individual star players that the other teams have. It's because they play so well as a team. Yeah, they're absolutely phenomenal in this one. And this catch right here on the Reckless just kind of seals the deal. Yeah, again, it's teamwork. Candy Panda was a little bit lower. He barely stays alive, but it's because N rated his support was able to save him with the Karma Shield. Big plays, gives him the victory. Now, SK take number one in the spots, and they don't give it up in the standings the rest of the way through the week. Gambit and and Rokat then fought it out for playoff positioning. Gambit only one game behind. Yeah, this was expected to be a slugfest. And right off the bat, there was some big action down here. Yanko's going way deep to get a kill. I think he went a little too far, though. Yeah, and the problem is they gave Diamond Kha'Zix, and Diamond pretty much put this game on his back for a that large was his portion. First kill. Yep. Yeah, and then we see the Renekton fight coming up next in the bottom lane. It looked like they had a nice combo kick into Yasuo. We're going to get him. We're going to get him. Uh-oh, here comes Kha'Zix. Yeah, Darian was tanky enough that Diamond gets himself a double kill and keeps it moving forward. Ends this fight 3-0-0. Zero, and zero. It just keeps going that way. Yeah, Diamond really showed up this game and made it a quick victory. That's an inhibitor down at 19 minutes free. Yeah, and so just pushed through. They kind of crushed the entire game down, barely giving anything back to Rokat. So Gambit finally getting their first win of the split over that team. Pretty important for these guys because that's a first round playoff match. Our next highlight, Gambit still had an outside chance at a top two finish. They had to get through Peke and Fnatic first. Yeah, the two time LCS split champions were going to put up a big fight and a huge battle here in the mid lane as both teams clash. Low kill game to this point, but this is a big fight. And the big pick for me there was actually the Soaz um, pick onto Yorick and the Nearly Javelin's keeping the team in for a while, but that pick against Ryze, it was Darian getting caught over and over. Yeah, and Fnatic just had more farm. They controlled the objectives and they controlled the vision. A lot of that did have to do with the York that Soaz brought out, but oh no, the Baron gets stolen by Leona. 
And Gambit hopes that's enough for them to get back into the game, but the problem is Fnatic get kills off that. They keep snowballing the game, and by the end game, you can see minions hitting the Nexus already. Yeah, just overwhelming pressure by the entire Fnatic team. Without the Baron steal, it would have been over a bit sooner, but Fnatic still takes it home. Hey, they're finishing the split very strong, the chance of top two for these guys. Next highlight is Alliance versus Gambit, another super close game up until yeah. about 30 minutes. So many good games and big matchups last Super Week over in Europe. And this is just yet another one. The double bubble after 30 minutes of standing off breaks the stalemate for Alliance. Exactly, and Alliance is able to dive in on enemy champions. Gonna see another clip of Nif's and Nami, the tidal wave coming across, and with three melee champions to dive in, what better champs to join with Nami? You were waiting for that one this entire yep. time. But really, it was Alliance playing extremely well against Gambit, really solidifying their place as being one of the strongest teams in Europe. Yeah, third place team overall going in, pretty, I mean, eventually favorites as well. Yeah, the Bubbles, Darien dying once more, Alliance just, they have such good ability to clean up fights. You're seeing yeah. the Kha'Zix resets, the jump on in, showing no fear. And you can see everyone is also trying to be more like Froggen for Alliance. They're wearing all the Alliance t-shirts now as opposed to the jackets. There's only one convert left and that's Tabs. Yeah, well, I mean, they've got a Soon jump, enough. so why wouldn't you name after Froggen? Now, of course, Gambit versus uh, Fnatic, so Rokat versus Fnatic here, another important match. Fnatic wins this, they get second place. Yeah, but it does not start off very well as Peke gets destroyed by Yankos and overpower in the mid lane. This Talon was looking pretty scary right here. Second kill of the game in mid lane, but then the Fnatic team collapses. Yeah, everyone's showing up for this one. Even though it starts out three to one in kills, there's just more flooding in Fnatic's way. And big surprise, we've got a Reckless Vayne. He's gonna show up, get a bunch of kills towards the end here. and. You know, Fed Vane, yeah. good thing for Fnatic. And it's the team coming in around him as well. The support play, the synergy. They had a slump in the middle of the season, but now they seem to be back in business. Yeah, they locked in the number two spot with that one. So even though the European League headed into the final day with an 81% chance of at least one tiebreaker, for only the second time all spring, there were no ties on the table Yay. when the week was over. Yay, normal games, no six-way tie. I couldn't believe it either. Let's take a second look just to make sure at the standings. Thanks to their perfect Super Week, SK Gaming moved into the top spot for the first time all year, while Fnatic's 7-1 record over the final three weeks of the spring gave them the second playoff bye. However, on the bottom side of the table are two teams heading into the Summer Promotion Tournament, which are the Super Hot Crew and Millennium, but more on them later. Now, for those four teams that finished in the middle of the table, they'll be facing off today in the quarterfinal round of the European Spring Playoffs. Let's check out the bracket. The winner of today's first best of three between Alliance and the Copenhagen Wolves will advance to face the team that's won every European LCS title so far, Fnatic. Meanwhile, the top-seeded team in the tournament, SK Gaming, is waiting in the semifinals for the winner of our second quarterfinal series, Rocket versus Gambit. Now, for a closer look at the quarterfinal matches, I'd like to welcome Quickshot to the show. What's going on, man? Yeah, not much freak. I'm just looking forward to getting the playoffs underway. Yeah, I can't believe they're actually here already. I'm going to start with the battle between fourth seed Roka and fifth seed Gambit. Looking at their head-to-heads this spring, who do you give the edge to in this best of three? I actually think this is a really tough question to answer. Even though their head-to-head -head sits at 3-1 in favor of Rocket, one of those victories was against the Gambit in pajamas mix, and most recently, Gambit absolutely decimated Rocket with a flawless siege composition. So if we look a little bit deeper into the match, it's pleasantly surprising to note how close these two teams are in terms of major metrics that we track. So we'll start with average CS at both 10 and 20 minutes across the entire team. There's only two minions that separates these teams, with Gambit having 54 average CS at 10 minutes to Rocket's 52. At 20 minutes, Rocket have 119 to Gambit's 121. With average gold, both teams hover around the 5,800 gold mark. In terms of objectives like dragons and barons, once again, it's extremely close. Rocket have got 10 dragons in their four games against Gambit, while Gambit have taken eight dragons. Rocket have got four barons, while Gambit have got three barons. So from a purely mechanical standpoint and statistical standpoint, both teams are extremely even, and it should be a good series. Okay, so the stats are similar, but the question still stands. Who do you give the edge to? So I think my gut tells me Gambit have got the edge here. Uh, they've been boot camping for the last 12 days in Kiev as a whole team. Alex has talked about the team analyst that's come in to help them find and fix their problems. And in general, you just have to think that if Gambit were able to adapt to the new patch and play with the intensity that we expect from them in playoffs, they're going to be a tough nut to crack. I do want to say that if any team's going to upset Gambit, it might just be Rocket. Rocket do have an ability to play sort of unconventional picks. They've also demonstrated an ability to disrupt Gambit in the early stages of the game. And if Rocket can surprise Gambit, get under their skin early, that might be the key to victory for the Polish powerhouse.
Trevor, I feel like you should go into politics because you've actually been dodging the question every single time. Every single so one more, one more time, who do you think is going to win? Oh, I hate that you have to put me on the spot. Okay, uh, if I have to pick a winner, Gambit. But I'm going to cop out a little bit, 70-30. I do still feel like if Rocket can get ahead early in game one, that's the key to victory. But overall, you've got to lean with that Gambit. Oh, I appreciate the hardcore commitment on that one, Quick Shot. So now I want to welcome Shox to the show for some straight answers and to get the team's word on their matchup. What's up, Shox? What's up, Freak? Hey, okay, so we're going to actually talk to you then about you talking to the players about their quarterfinal series. What did they have to say about their opponents? Well, when I talked to Rockat's Vander, he pointed to Gambit's jungler Diamond as their strongest link on the team, highlighting his experience, his ability to counter gank effectively, and his early game synergy with Alex Ish. Now, on the other hand, when I asked Vander where he thought Gambit was vulnerable, he pointed to their bottom lane. He said that Edward and Genja actually put their team at a disadvantage in many LCS games, although he did say that they played very well at IEM. Now, overall, Vander is confident that if they can play the standard meta and avoid bad rotations that cost them objectives, they do have a great chance. Now, when I spoke to Gambit's Edward before he broke his finger on his foot, he also had some nice things to say about his opponents today. Edward told me that Rockat does not play like every other European team. They have different play styles and he said that Gambit will need to adapt to them if they want to have success. Edward also complimented Rockat's jungler Jankos and mid laner Overprow. He said that they were quote, really good and that they were the key for the win for Rockat. As far as Rockat weaknesses go, Edward identified two points. First off, he says that Rockat's 80 carry Selever is, quote, vulnerable, and that Rockat struggles to adapt to what their opponents are doing. Edward said that Rockat just plays their game and does not prepare 100% for the team that they're going to be facing. Now, heading into their quarterfinal matchup against Rockat, Edward is confident that they can win. He said, quote, we are absolutely stronger because we have boot camped for 12 days before the playoffs, and we all know what happens then. Yeah, thank you very much, Shox. That is a very scary gambit if they do get the boot camp going. Let's move on then to the opening battle in today's playoff action, the fight between third-seeded Alliance and sixth-seeded Copenhagen Wolves. Quick shot, based on the standings and the head-to-head, -head, the series should go in Alliance's favor. What do the Wolves have to do to get the upset over Frog and Squad? Okay, so in order for the Wolves to surprise Alliance, they need to find a way to shut down both Wicked and Froggen. Wicked has continually found ways to shine by out-CSing everyone else on the Rift, when playing against the Wolves. He's got 81 CS at 10 minutes and 181 CS at 20 minutes, and it's great numbers. Froggen, on the other hand, has only given up two deaths across all four games played against the Wolves. His 18.5 KDA and near flawless positioning has been immensely helpful in getting Alliance their victories this split. So for Alliance, they'll be looking to play their game at their pace and simply not allow their playstyle to be interrupted. The man that I'm looking at to get in the faces of both Wicked and Froggen is amazing. He was the first European player to receive back-to-back -back MVP awards. His lease and play was the best in the European split, in the middle of the split, rather. So if Amazing can find a way to channel that level of performance, it might be just the bark that his pack needs to run down Alliance. I do want to throw out a brief mention to Forgiven, though. He's not had the same level of success against Alliance that we have seen against other teams. His average CS at 10 minutes and 20 minutes is lower than we see for his overall league average. And as a very large part of the Wolves' success when they're winning, we'll need to see if he can help bring a positive impact into this series. All right, quick shot. I think I know what you're going to say, but I do want to get it on record. Who do you see coming out with a win in this quarterfinal series? So this one is a little more clear cut for me. I do think Alliance is a pretty strong favorite. In general, I feel their individual performances as well as their teamwork have been at a higher level leading up to the playoffs. So Alliance over Wolves. All right, thank you very much, Quick Shot, for a dedicated answer. Now for an inside look at the teams and how they're preparing for today, I'd like to welcome back Shox. It's been a long time. I've missed you, Freak. I have too, but thankfully you're here, so we're okay. We're on a screen together. Now when you hit up Alliance and the Wolves, what do they have to say about the quarterfinal match? Well, when I spoke to Frog and he complimented the Wolves' experimentation with new play styles and new picks. He liked the top lane Heimerdinger and the Wolves trying an early siege strategy instead of waiting for the late game. But he was critical of the Wolves' bottom lane and their reliance on wave clear champs that need to stall till they have enough items to make an actual impact. Now, overall, Frog and feels that their versatility in champs and play style will give them an advantage, especially in a best of three series. Meanwhile, the Wolves' young buck is confident they can take the series because they are, quote, putting all our effort into Alliance, strategy-wise, and champion pool wise. Now Youngbook said that he believes that uh, Alliance doesn't adapt as fast as other teams do to new metas and that their champion pool can be stubborn to change and that leaves them quote vulnerable in a brand new patch. Now Youngbook does confess that because they are going all in preparing for Alliance that quote will have a less uh, chance of winning further rounds but it will ensure us our stay in the summer split. 
All right, thank you very much for the info, Shocks. We'll let you go and get ready for that battle between Alliance and the Wolves. Can't wait for that one. That's going to be fun. So we've been focusing on what's on the line for the winning squads, but we do need to turn our attention to the fate of the teams that come up short today. The two squads who lose will be dropped into Wednesday's fifth place match. Now, the team that wins that series will lock in their spot in the summer split and they're safe. But the team that finishes sixth will be relegated into the promotion tournament where they have to fight for their LCS lives. The bright spot for that sixth place team, they get first choice of the challenger team they want to face. Either challenger champions Cloud and Eclipse, second place Ninjas in Pajamas, or Denial Esports. Then, after the sixth place team makes their selection of Denial Esports official, the Super Hot crew gets second choice with Millennium getting the leftovers. The 2014 European LCS Summer Promo Tournament will kick off next week on Thursday, April 24th, with a best of five between Millennium and their challenger opponent at 7 p.m. Central European Summertime. Now it's time to turn our attention to the LCS pros that were godlike during the spring split as we, as we reveal the first ever all-league team. Now, FYI, these five all-pros were chosen by a panel of experts and the LCS teams themselves, because who better to pick an MVP than the teams he stomped on the way to winning the award? I'd like to welcome back Quickshot one more time to help reveal the team and the MVP. You ready, Quickshot? I'm always ready to fire quickly. It's in the name, Freak. That's really lame. Let's start with the awards <laughs> in the top lane, where your all-league team member is Fnatic Soaz. He had the highest KDA of any starting European top laner, as well as picking up the most assists at the position. Yeah, as the only French top laner in the European LCS, I think it's fitting that his most played champion is Renekton at six games. But it's only one of 12 total champions that Soez has played this split. Even though Soez was outspoken about disliking the tank meta, he's shown a great ability with all manner of tanks and bruisers in the top lane. And in my opinion, is still performing better on that class of champion than his AP champions. Also, it cannot be ignored that he played and won with Yorick during the last Super Week of the split. Now, I'm not sure if that helped or hindered his chances of getting MVP, but it worked, helped get the win, and that's what matters. You know what you should have said? I'm ready for a Trevory thing. Let's take a trip to the jungle. <laughs> Hope you brought your Hunter's machetes where one of the league's most celebrated players can add all League 2014 to his list of accomplishments. Diamond had the second highest KDA for a European jungler this spring while getting his hand on more gold per minute than anyone else in his role over in Cologne. Now, the most amazing thing about Diamond is not that he's the all-league uh, all jungler, but that he's performed at this level again. From the moment that Diamond burst onto the scene, he's been heralded as one of the world's best junglers, and he shows no signs of slowing down. He's played 12 total champions, some of them good, with seven games in Lee Sin and a 5.4 KDA. It's like Evelyn with a 4.5 KDA. And some of them bad, like his Skana and his Udia. I wasn't a fan. But you can't deny the fact that Diamond has set precedence for new jungle champions in the past, and one of these attempts may just be the next best thing. In truth, Diamond has not lost his edge, and he is totally deserving of the title. Absolutely. So up next, the mid lane. There, it was Alliance's Froggen, who reached new heights as he helped his team jump from last place to the third seed in the playoffs. He also recorded the second most kills of any player in the European LCS, while compiling the highest KDA of any EU LCS mid laner. Well, Froggen has continually impressed me this split with how varied his champion pool has been from week to week. He's shown an ability to play farm-heavy champions like Gragas and Ziggs. He's played assassins like LeBlanc and Zed. He's even thrown in the likes of Karthus and Cassidy into the mix. You never really know what he's going to play, but what you do know is that it will be handled excellently and played well. Considering how intense the European mid lane scene is, it's actually great to see Froggen earn the spot as all league mid laner and rise above the competition. Yeah, it's working for him. So that brings us to the 2014 all league AD carry. And the top vote getter was Fnatic's Reckless. He put the team on his back and carried them through Super Week and into a first round buy in the playoffs. Plus, he compiled some incredible stats over the spring split. He led the European LCS in gold per minute, KDA, and had the least deaths in the entire LCS for someone who played all 28 games. Reckless joining the LCS was one of the most highly anticipated moves of the year. Having sat on the bench from IPL5, waiting to come of age and take his seat amongst one of Europe's best teams, there was a lot of pressure on this young AD phenom. In his opening week, Reckless earned the very first MVP award of 2014. He did not die in his opening three games, and he racked up a weak KDA of 19.3. 
This incredibly positive trend continued even through Fnatic's slump, and Reckless always found a way to have a positive impact on Fnatic's games. So that brings us now to the all-league team support. When the, and when the votes were tallied, based on the votes, everything, casters, players, teams, and Ridden and Yellowstar were tied. Now, I can't argue with the votes because they both had great spring splits. Yellowstar led the European LCS in assists and KDA by a support, while N-Rated had the second most kills secured from the support position. It's actually somewhat poetic that after the spring split wraps up, both N-Rated and Yellowstar are the all-league supports, considering that Yellowstar moved to the support role when N-Rated was benched last year in summer. Even though these two players were tied in the votes, let's start by talking about Yellowstar. I was one of his harshest critics last year, and I was pleasantly just surprised to see how fantastic Yellowstar has become in the support role over time. At the beginning of the split, he favored aggressive, in-your-face champions like Leona and Annie, and as bans started to get drawn, he transitioned to Morgana and Karma with ease. You always feel like Yellowstar does what is needed for his team. I want to move over to N-Rated, who has a very similar champion pool, but he's also pulled out Galio, Blitzcrank, and is showing the world how to play support Kale with three wins and zero losses. For Enrated though, I think he gets more of those kills because of the fact that he's the primary shot caller and initiator for the team. He's also the in-game leader, and as I've said, primary decision maker. So this has helped him earn a spot in the All-League supports. He got the Week 11 MVP, and also led his team to the number one seed going into this week's playoffs. And it's good performance there. So with an All-League team stacked with that much talent and six players, it's hard to pick just one of them as the MVP. But the experts did, and after tallying up the votes, your 2014 European League Championship Series Spring Split Most Valuable Player is Alliance's mid laner Froggen. Now, while his individual stats earned him the All-League mid laner honor, it was his value to the Alliance squad that garnered him the MVP. Not only did he build the team himself, but after a shaky start to the season, he won back-to-back -back MVPs for Week 8 and Week 9 as he led the team from the bottom of the table up to the top. Yeah, even in losing games, Froggen still has great stats. He farms well under pressure, he has shown that he can roam around the map and impact his side lanes, and he can play an incredibly wide array of champions to an excellent level. As the leader and captain of Alliance, and as a player that has been very vocal about wanting to win, he's been an incredibly large driving force in getting Alliance into the third seed in the playoffs. If you think back to games where he was just trying to split push as Kale and as Yasuo, despite his team being behind, it's that objective-focused gameplay that has trickled down to the rest of the team as the weeks have gone on. If you draw contrast between week one and week 11, you would not say that this was the same set of players, nor the same team as a whole, because their decision-making, their individual play, their laning, and every single aspect of the game has progressively improved, and it's all been led by Froggen. All of these improvements have allowed Alliance to win 10 out of their last 12 games. All right, quick shot before I let you go. There's one more piece of business we need to take care of. Who's going to win the 2014 European LCS Spring Split Championship? I'm going to have to dance around this one a little bit because I have thought long and hard. I don't know who's going to be crowned Spring Split Champion because I think Fnatic, they're looking to take their third title in a row. Gambit, looking to grab their first. I think SK are looking to surprise. But because you're going to pressure me and ask me to put a name down, I've set my eyes on Alliance. I think they have more than enough synergy, more than enough ability to claim the title, and I can't wait to see them grab the Spring Split Champion title. All right, quick shot. thank you very much for the straight answer. We're gonna let you go and get ready for the European LCS playoffs, but first, thank you for your MVP performance today. Well, thank you very much, Freak. I will be back later in the show with Joe, as well as Cast Rocket and Gambit. That's gonna be fun. So, we've revealed Europe's all-league team and handed out an MVP, but there's one thing we haven't hit yet. Glorious, glorious stats. Let's rectify that now and take a look at the top killer, the perpetually respawning and the most helpful players in the League Championship Series this spring. Let's kick it off with the European kill, death and assist leaders, where XPeke was the most deadly European for the second straight split with his 125 kills. Then there's super hot crew support Migza, who's won 28 deaths over 28 games, uh, set a new LCS record. As far as assists, Yellowstar's 240 over 28 games not only led the league, it earned him a spot in the all-league team. And while all three of them mastered one category, the guy who led the league in overall KDA was the all-league AD carry Reckless. Now let's shift our attention from individual performances to the teams, where no surprise, Fnatic topped almost every single category. The two-time LCS champs and second seed in this year's spring playoffs racked up the most kills, the most assists, and thus the highest KDA, while Migza led his super hot crew to the top spot in at least one category this year. 
An outlet's arcane shift from the single season marks to the all-time records and take a look at the players and team who rewrote the LCS record books. Of course, we should start with the super hot Cruz Migza. His 128 deaths broke Kiwi Kid's heart and his previous death total of 126. Next up is the man in the solo mid for TSM. Bjergsen broke his own record for highest kills per game in a split. It was 6.91, it's now 7.05. Just like his teammate Wild Turtle up his own mark for the highest gold per minute over a split by more than seven gold pieces. The next record to fall was for the most kills by a jungler. Diamond previously held that mark with 89, but Meteos crushed it by stacking up 107 kills. I guess he likes to farm champs as well as camps. The team to rewrite the record book was Cloud9, but actually they just added their name to a record they already own. Their 13 wins in a row to close out this spring split tied the record they set last summer. And finally, we have another record that got scratched but not broken, the record for most deaths by a jungler. Considering the dubious nature of this one, I'm sure Nintendo X doesn't mind sharing this one with NK Inc. Now, from the record breakers to the plays that broke your brain, let's send it across the studio to Jat for the outplays of the year. Thanks, Freak. One thing the LCS pros do well is make nearly impossible plays look effortless. In case you don't realize just how much effort it takes to pull off the top plays of the year, well, that's why I'm here on the big screen. Biggest play, at least that we have from Europe, actually happened during week one. Re Reckless and Yellow Star showing why they are on the all-pro team right from the start of it in a 2v3. Let's roll this clip at half speed just to see exactly what happens. First off, it looks like Fnatic is going in on a gambit, but it's actually going to be a bit of a bait. As soon as Yellow Star fully commits, he gets flayed back in the turret. Let's pause it here, actually. Let's take a look at all the bad things that are happening for Fnatic right now and wow, why it was such an outplay. So Yellow Star is in turret range right now. Genja has about 40% of his health left whereas Yellowstar's already burned his Tibbers, and Reckless is not only out of kill range or attack range, he has a full health Shivana on him, level seven, with an ultimate up. He's closed him without even using his gap closer. So let's continue to roll this at half speed to see really just what happens. Yellowstar actually gets a full cycle of spells out, dodges the hook, is actually able to land a double stun, and Reckless stays in front of Diamond so he can get the super mega death rocket out and get the move speed. At that point, we can roll it at full speed. He flashes away from the dragon, and miraculously, Fnatic made it out of all this, getting two kills in a 2v3 without dying. That's why, to me, this was the biggest outplay we actually saw in the entire year in Europe, especially the barrier right at the end. But that was just Reckless and Yellow Star right from the start being amazing. Let's send it back over to Freak for a final tally of the number of champs that got to see some playing time on the Rift this split. Thank you very much, Dat. We headed into the final week of the 2014 Spring Split, five champs short of the 93 unique selections that were made last spring. And in case you weren't keeping track of the champs that got picked during Super Week, well, we were, so it's okay. The week started off with a ton of promise as Diamond pulled out Udyr and Youngbuck whipped out Heimerdinger in the same game. Soaz helped out the quest for the record with a top lane Yorick, but that was it for Europe which left us too short heading into the NALCS. Sneaky flew in with a Corky, and Zuna chose Kogma, which brought us to 93, officially tying the record for most champs played in a split, but that's as high as it went. Now for hitting up the LCS preview show on Twitter and predicting who was going to be played in the next champion select, well, there were several people who giggled as they tweeted out the donger. Only one person, though, mentioned Udyr, and even though Fox actually cheated and chose two champions in his tweet, We'll let it slide because he actually chose the two champs that made the debut, Udyr and Heimerdinger. So, nice work to Fox. Now, while the champs selected in the playoffs won't count towards our spring split total, it's still a lot of fun to guess. So hit us up at LOL Esports, hashtag at LCS Preview, and try to predict which champs will be played for the first time this season. Now, with the playoff games being played on 4.5, who knows what champs we'll be seeing in the Rift? Actually, I know someone. Let's send it over to Jap for his breakdown of the biggest 4.5 patch changes and his champion predictions. We're gonna see Victor, but actually I'm actually gonna say Brand or maybe Master Yi. But the 4.5 patch is what we're here to talk about. And it is set to bring some major changes to the LCS Spring Playoffs as it affects everything from champions to items to runes. So let's put on our new boots and take a stroll through the changes. The biggest change obviously is actually the boot enchantments. Alacrity, more movement speed. Captain is cheaper, gives you more movement speed as well. Distortion has some cool new effects with flash and teleport. And Fury is more accessible for AD carries and melee champions. What all of this actually means is that we're gonna see more play of the top four boot enchantments and a little bit less play from the home guard boots because they have been reduced in power quite a bit. I think this is gonna open up a lot of versatility and we're gonna see a lot more Alacrity, Distortion, 
Captain, and Furors. Next change, of course, is the runes. Now, a lot of this changed. Armor runes reduced. We got health runes being buffed up. Lots of interesting things going on, but the main impacts are going to be this. 80 carries are probably dropping lifesteal quintessences. They'll be bringing attack speed, so we'll see more damage down there from the 80 carries. Mid laners are going to be a little healthier because they're most likely not taking armor runes anymore. They're going to opt for health. Other than that, there's not a huge overwhelming impact from the runes. I think the larger impact is actually going to come from the summoner spell choices in the bottom lane. Exhaust and heal both got some pretty hefty improvements for 80 carries in particular. If an 80 carry wants to have individual protection from assassins, it is now more damage reduction and also the range is increased, so he can use it before he gets jumped on by an assassin type player. Also, if you bring double heal, especially late game, you're healing upwards to 1000 health on two targets, which is absolutely absurd since it has a double use with the move speed now as well. So definitely a lot more exhaust and heal, a lot less ignite and barrier in the bot lane. So we'll have to watch out for that one. In the jungle though, Feral Flare. This thing made huge waves in solo queue. I'm not sure what types of waves it's gonna make in competitive because it has that stacking component. Trying to get to 25 stacks on the Feral Flare is just much harder in the competitive landscape with lane swaps happening early on in the game. Junglers just don't have the time to farm. If a team wants to make it work, you're gonna see a flare on someone like a Xin Zhao or maybe even a Master Yi, but it's not going to be as dominant as we see in solo queue. Still excited to see that change though. Now, mid lane wise, Lulu, she got nerfed pretty heavily. Help picks, you can no longer do the double glitter lance with putting one picks on and shooting off two glitter lances. So a diminished role from Lulu, but I still think she's gonna be a priority pick for a lot of people just because glitter lance is so spectacular. Also, last thing to touch on is Shen is disabled for this week's playoffs and maybe a little bit more into the future. That's gonna be a hit to a few of the top laners that we're trying Shen out. Other than that though, 4.5 changes have a huge impact on the spring playoffs. But like Brad Pitt said in Moneyball, adapt or die. Freak. And thank you very much, Jat. It's now time to turn our attention to the champions that the pros picked, because we just talked about new ones. Let's talk about the old ones. Here are the most picked and bands champ from most picked and banned champs from the 2014 spring split, starting with the most popular choices in Europe. Tied for fifth most picks in EU this spring is a pair of jungle friends, Elise and Lee Sin. Seems like half the highlights we saw from Cologne last split were on those two champions, and based on how many times they were picked, I'm probably right. Laying down the law at number four is the Sheriff of Piltover. Caitlyn comes in as the second most picked AD carry in Europe. At three, the top picked top lane Renekton sliced and diced his way into 61 games last split. While the runner-up position was hooked by, his, by, ugh, by the Thresh Prince, his mortal enemy slash lane mate Lucian lit up the European stage more than any other champ last spring. Those 78 Lucian uh, picks by the pros means he took to the rift in more than 70% of the European LCS games this spring. Pretty big improvement over the 0% during last summer split. Goes to show how much being available in champ select really improves your chances of getting picked. Works out for him. Now, Kale comes in as the fifth spot, though, for uh, most banned. And if I had to face Overpower four times a split, I'd ban it too. At number four is everybody's favorite fire stuff, Teddy Bear and his owner, while LeBlanc was uh, locked out of champ select 35 times. At number two is Elise, who has the distinction of being the only champ to be both on the Insta Lock and Insta Ban top five. And if you add her 43 bans to her 47 picks, she was involved in champ select 80% of the time. That brings us to the number one on the list, Kasadin. Despite being let out of the ban jail on parole thanks to the 4.4 patch, the Voidwalker got his sneakers stolen more times than anyone else in the league. Now, uh, from the most feared champions to the most mind-blowing plays of the European LCS, or as Quickshot likes to call them, the Penta. Coming in at number five, Edward shows off his support Man, carry skills. Consistently throughout the game is Edward going to get caught out here by Candy Panda. He actually turns wow, the damage the around him. This is a support against the AD carry. Edward going low, he's going to fall down. He actually got the kill before falling from that one. And number four, Frog and Hops a ride on the Thresh Express. Oh, I like the caught out again. Does himself favors. I'm not too sure if this is going to quite be enough. Oh. The Lantern Flash run near pulls Frog and across from two. <laughs> Right there, that was so good, they've had to pause the game to just give him a high five. And number three is Froggen again, this time with a shocking flash. Pekka's is in trouble. Oh, Pekka is in trouble. There is a decoy in the cyclone, gonna catch up Pekka. So we're flashed away from, what a flash from Froggen. They pick up a kill. That was so, so well-timed. Brilliant play from Alliance. So many Alliance plays. Number two, shook into the hook. I don't actually know if they really saw each other there, but the Q's gonna land, there's oh. the kick, oh, into the hook. It doesn't get much better than that, I'm afraid. 
attempt. Brings up the kill onto Celebre. What a combo from Alliance. Absolutely beautiful. And the top play from the EU during the spring split is, well, amazing. Push on this mid in the turret. Wow, superb stuff from Amazing there. Landing the kick onto Peke, following straight across and on towards Yellow Star, just punting him back in towards the team. All right, guys, we've come to the end of another LCS preview show. But now if you're thinking to yourself, hey, where are all the North American highlights? Don't worry, going to have your answer. On Friday, before the North American LCS pros take to the rift, we're going to have a North American version of the LCS preview show coming your way. Now, guys, before we head out, let's last hit some of the silliest moments from the spring split. This will be a, a good opportunity for me to show off what I can do with my hands. Four chains! He's oh, got the lock in there's the hook! A fifth chain to come in! Where's he pulling it from? Hi, now you can see me. Wolf God, double fang. Knife and pork in the bag. We're gonna eat some wolves. Oh. Are you gonna get him on one? Got him, got him, got him, got him. <laughs> ha, ha. Yeah, there we go! He can have his cake and eat it too! Rocket just melts the super hot one the combo! Obviously, see her pretty face every morning makes it a lot better. I would like you to give you a rust. I saw him actually in the crowd while we played the game. <laughs> and actually, he kissed me right now. Oh my god, are you serious, Afro Esports Express recently revealed the secret behind CLG's decision making, which is, of course, magic spinners. The swag lord himself just trots out with his red pants on. Run, 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 run. Still go for the kills. He's not going to get it. Oh! No, my god, he does get it. Coast breaks the win streak of Team Solo Men to go 5 and 8. Overall, I'm like, if you don't lose, you're going to win. Up until they lose the game, they're winning. Thanks for that insight. Now, check this out. Double spider. Hashtag 34 deaths the dream for Reggie. <laughs> the birds, the birds are great. Here is your funny hat freak. And I have decided that I am a winner as well. So, but not congratulations to me.